this morning we're going to start a new sermon series. Um, and the sermon series really came up with, typically we go through books of the Bible, and then we'll take a break from a book, and we'll kind of do more topical. However, it's still exegetical, which means we're still going to go verse by verse, word by word. Uh, what we're going to take a deep dive into uh, are different sayings of Jesus. Uh, different sayings of Jesus, and typically uh, when Jesus spoke, uh, particularly this passage we're going to look at today, uh, was, it came out of the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount, which is Beatitudes are part of that, Jesus begins to teach his followers. He has his followers there. He has those who are just there to criticize. He has those who are curious. But when Jesus teaches, he teaches really in a way that seems to be a bit radical to people. It's outside the norm. It doesn't make sense. It's anti-cultural and it's counter-cultural. So in this particular case, Jesus is going to teach on really this, this word that I think has been um, to some degree perverse, has been misused, has been diluted, this word on love. You know, we, we use this word love in all different kinds of ways, right? I love pizza. And, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Pastor David. We use this word love for I love pizza, or I, I love football, I love basketball, I love my wife, or I love, and this word is so interchangeable, but in order to understand the true meaning of the, lo- of the word love uh, and, and what Jesus meant by this, he, he says something that's about to shock his listeners. He says, love your enemies. Uh, uh, let me just tell you, that's unbelievably difficult because as soon as I said that, some of you are thinking, I didn't come here to hear how to love somebody I can't stand. And as soon as I said that word enemy, somebody's name came to mind, right? And and the truth is, in our culture today, it's not hard to make enemies. Had somebody cut you off on the way to church this morning, they became a quick enemy. You were probably even in your car singing worship music, right? Right? And you turned very quickly from a praise singer to listening to Metallica because you were ready to go track them down. <laughs> or um, an enemy, a, a family member who maybe didn't respond in a way that you felt they should have responded. Or, or maybe this enemy is a, is a co-worker. Or maybe, and the list goes on, we, it doesn't take much for us to create enemies. And most of the time, these people don't even know that they are enemies. Somebody who has politically different views than you do become our enemies. And the list goes on and on and on. So you can imagine when Jesus says this to his listeners, there's all kinds of filters that are going on, right? So Jesus says to love your enemies, and all of a sudden, they're filtering it through the political differences that are going on. They're filtering it through the pains that they've experienced because somebody has really hurt them and has ruined their lives. They think about their parents that maybe abused them. They think about their spouse who betrayed them. They think about a coworker. You think about a boss who didn't respond the way they should have responded. And all of a sudden, we create these enemies. And so when Jesus said this, you have to understand that he is aiming straight for the heart. He is straight aiming for the heart of a man and a woman. Because here's why Jesus is saying this. When Jesus is teaching, what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to help Christ's followers understand that we are supposed to look differently than the world. So when Jesus is teaching, he is teaching about ways and biblical principles that we should live because we are now the conduits of his love. I want you to think about that. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a vessel of his love. And Jesus wants to use you to reflect his love and restore his image. Just think about that. Jesus wants to use you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he wants to use you to reflect his love and restore his image. So he says this to these people who are listening. Luke chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, turn there. He says this earth-shattering statement. By the way, up to this point, the Old Testament does not speak of loving your enemies. And so this is new information even for those who consider themselves to be religious. It says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Already, this sounds crazy. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those 
who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away from your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. And then he continues in verse 32. Here's where he begins to separate the Christ follower from those who do not know Christ. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners, those are people who are living apart from God, for even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Then he says it again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, don't you think about that statement for just a minute? Jesus is speaking to a bunch of people, just as, as kind of we are today hearing this passage. When I read this passage, um, a list of who I consider to be enemies came in my mind, and I began to think uh, about this scripture, how the scripture says, if you're going to follow me, I want you to love them. See, here is the truth. The real enemy today is not the one sitting across the aisle. It's not the one posting on social media. It's not the one who is at your job site. The real enemy is not the one you see. It's the one you cannot see. But the real enemy, the one you cannot see, has done a great job of having you begin to hate another person who is made in the image of God. He has done a wonderful job of having us become so divisive and he polarizes us and he's just having a field day. It's like, it's like he's just pulling strings and he's seeing all this chaos go on and he's making people fight against each other and we're thinking that the person in the flesh is the enemy. But the scripture says that we do not fight against flesh and blood but against the unseen principalities of this world. So when Jesus is saying, if you only love those who love you, what different are you from the sinners, from the secular people? If you only love those who adore you, what different are you? John 13, love one another. By this they will know that you are my disciple. What gives it away that you're following Jesus? That you love one another. Now be very careful because loving doesn't mean condoning Loving does not mean condoning what God calls sin. So you can love one another with the love of Christ. And we're going to see here in just a minute, and I love what he says in verse 35, but love your enemies. And he says, love your enemies. This is the, the, the thesis. This is the statement for this text. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return from your enemies. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. So if he is saying, love your enemies, he is telling us, I want you to be kind to the ungrateful, and I want you to be kind to the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. As we dig into this text, I want you to think about, because I want this to have meaning to you, I want this to really get to our hearts today, I'm going to ask you this question. Who is your enemy today? Can you, can you see their face in your head? When you think about their name, does it just drive you absolutely crazy? When people begin to talk about this person, when this person is in your presence, all these emotions and all these feelings come up. And the truth is, let's just be honest, you, you can't stand them. You cannot stand these people or this person. And the truth is, it's probably because of something that they've done to you. They may know it, they may not know it, but you have these these feelings towards a person where you're starting to think, I think for the first time, I, I feel like I hate somebody. 
there's this anger in me. And listen, I think we've all dealt with this. When, when somebody hurts you, there's something in us that th- this hurt turns into bitterness. And an unresolved bitterness begins to be watered and fruit produces. And you see this person's name and you can't stand them. And, and the truth is, if you were to say it out loud, you don't want anything good to happen to them. In fact, if they are blessed by God, it angers you. Because there's a piece of you that wants revenge. You want to see them hurt for what they've done to you. You want an eye for an eye. You want justice because it feels like injustice when somebody has hurt you so badly and yet they're not getting repaid. And when you see them, you cannot stand them and you are angry towards them and and you take them everywhere you go. You take them on family vacation with you. You start talking about them on family vacation. You take them to work. You take them to, to your family dinners. If you're married, you, you take them, the, you have pillow talk at night with your spouse about the people you can't stand. No matter where you go, you take them with you. And you can't stand them. And it becomes a miserable life because now they have exhausted you. You're like, I'm exhausted. I'm just, you ever said, I'm so tired, tired of talking about them. Let's stop talking about them. Did you see what they did? Did you see what they posted? I think that post was towards me. I know what they were doing. And here's where it gets dangerous, where all of a sudden you replay with the the offense that sometimes they don't even know they've done to you. And you replay the offense over and over and over and over and over to where it becomes real. And then we do, we all do this. I'm going to say we do this. All of a sudden we become mind readers and motive readers. Like we really, this is where it gets scary, is we begin to insert motives in people's hearts. And we believe that we, I know why, I know why they did this. They would never say it, but I, are you the Holy Spirit all of a sudden? Oh, now you know what they're thinking? Is that a spiritual gift? Because I missed that one. And then you just, you just, you're angry and you hate them. It's exhausting, isn't it? I've been there. It's absolutely exhausting. So who's your enemy today? Do you know that you don't have to live that way? Do you know that you can see the person? Here, here's what happens. When, when you allow people to take that much of your mental, emotional, and spiritual energy from you, and you're completely exhausted because you're sick of seeing this person, do you know that um, you become the prisoner? <laughs> you are the prisoner. You are the prisoner. But, but let me share something with you. You don't have to live that way. You can actually be set free from your own imprisonment. And so Jesus gives us the model of this. And I want you to look at your scripture because he is about to give us the solution. So I want you to think about in your head or write it down. If the person is next to you and you don't want to write their name, here's what I do. Just write a smiley face like that's them. You know who that is, but the people around you don't know who that is, but you know who that is. So I want you, I, I'm, I'm being serious now. I, I want the word of God to bring healing to your life because I believe this is true. I believe Jesus is offering us something today that can free us up. And I get it. Most of us are thinking, you don't know what they've done. They don't deserve to be freed up. And you are right. But none of us deserve to be free. That's what's so good about the grace of God is that none of us deserve it. Yet he extended it. And he wants us to reflect that. And it, it's, let me just share with you, it is impossible to do within your own self. And you're going to need the Spirit's help. You're going to need to ask the Holy Spirit, would you give me the power and the strength to forgive? Because God, I don't want to, and I hate this person. So here's what he gives us. And I hope and pray for you, church, this can just free you up today. I pray that you don't have to talk about these people on family vacations. You don't have to bring them everywhere with you because the truth is what they do doesn't determine what God has planned for you. Do you understand that? What somebody else does doesn't determine what God has planned for you. So here's what Jesus says. But to you who are listening, this is more of this Greek word is like, listen, I want you to listen being ready to respond. I want you to hear what I'm about to say because it works. Isn't that amazing? The Bible works. He says, love your enemies. This word love, by the way, 
is this, is this agapo. It means agapo in the actual Greek. It's the agapo. It's, it's a love that sacrifices for others. Um, that's a love that's built off of the foundation of grace and not somebody's merit. So it's not a love that somebody deserves. It's a love that is birthed out of grace. Just like this is the love that Jesus gave us. For God so loved the world, watch this, so God so loved the world, agape the world, meaning he gave his love that was based on the foundation of grace, not because we deserved it, but because it was based on the foundation of grace. The same word, watch this, when he tells us to love, same word, John three sixteen, love the foundation of grace, not because they deserve it, but when you offer love, it'll free you up and it reflects the love of Christ. Love who? Your enemies. Who are your enemies? Um, anybody that seems to be a irritant or resistant in your life. You will have enemies that you have created and they don't even know that you're their enemy. And then you'll have enemies that um, you know you're just going back and forth and you can't stand each other. And, and we're all gonna have these enemies, intentional and unintentional. We just form enemies. Some of us, all these enemies have become part of our identity. And you don't know what it's like to live without these people being enemies. Can you imagine being great friends with your in-laws? See, I thought you would laugh, but it seems so unfathomable that you're like, nah, that ain't even, that ain't true. That's not, <laughs> not true. Okay, can you imagine loving somebody who has a different political view than you? And this is what he's saying, love your enemies, people that um, it, deep down inside you know you don't like for whatever reason. And then he's about to give us the solution to free us up. Here's what he says, I'm gonna give us several points if you're taking notes this morning. If you want to know, pastor, how do I set myself free from my enemies? Here you go, he gives us a list here. The scripture tells us, he lays it out. Here's what he says, number one, do good to those who hate you, do good. Uh, this, this do good uh, means, it, it's, here's how you can paraphrase it, it's faith in action. It actually means do something for those who hate you. Do something for those who cannot stand you. Do something for them. You can even pick up the phone right now as I'm talking and say, I'm in church today, I'm praying for you. And now if, if someone sends it over here and it buzzes over here, then we're, we got more conversations we need to have because then we know y'all have some issues y'all need to take care of which leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with your brother as far as it is up to you. As far as it is up to you, do good to those who hate you. So, um, number one, how are you set free? Look for opportunities to good, do good to those who hate you. Tomorrow, when you go in um, to the office and you cannot stand this person you always see, um, how about saying, hey man, uh, I brought you a coffee this morning, I was thinking about you doing good to those who hate you. Staff, if I get like eight coffees tomorrow, we're gonna have a big issue. <laughs> but, but it's literally, uh, my assistant's here, Zena, do not bring me coffee tomorrow. Uh, but, but literally, it's, it's let me look for an opportunity to serve. Uh, think about that for just a minute. Now, I feel like there are levels of enemies. There are people that I just really don't like you, but I need to learn to love you. And then there are people like you have traumatized my life. I'm not telling you to go buy them coffee. But I'm telling you, when the Lord presents an opportunity for restoration, it's not going to be easy. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to be easy to love your enemies. It is one of the most difficult things we will ever have to do. If I can just be honest and real with you today, one of the most difficult things you will ever have to do is love your enemy, which is why you need the Holy Spirit because you cannot do it on your own. Let's be honest. You don't want to, do you? Can we just be honest? You don't want to. You want to see them hurt because of the way they hurt you. That seems more natural. And, but he says, do good. Do, do something. I'm not, listen, you don't even have to go fake it and force it. But to do good means, you know what? There's an opportunity to do something nice. It's right in front of me. It's like God gave me an alley-oop. But I don't want to do, I don't want to dunk it. But God, I feel like this is from you. I don't want to invite them to come, but I feel like you're telling me to invite them. I'll do it, God. By faith, I will do it, God. So he tells them, do good to those who hate 
you. Then he says this, bless those who curse you. This word bless is not to go buy somebody something. This word bless means to speak highly of people. So here, here's what this looks like. He's saying speak highly of who? Those who speak negatively of you. So uh, we have all heard people come to us and say, hey, so-and-so said something about you. Or people who will come around you and they're so passive aggressive, it's like, I, I'm pretty confident that was a shot at me. Like, I'm pretty confident that was a shot at me. And, 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 and so when these people, and you know they're slandering you, and when you know they're speaking negatively of you, it's very difficult because you want to clear your name, and you want to go trace the path, and you want to go clean it all up. But let me just tell you something. What works a lot easier is if you respond the way the Word of God is telling us to, and He is saying, literally, bless them, speak highly of them. And you're thinking, but there's nothing good to say about them. Find something. I mean, the, 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 there are times when there are names that have come up my, around my wife and I, and I'm just like, I'm cringing because I just like, I want to expose these people. I want to expose, like, I, I, we have to tell these people that those people aren't who they think they are. Can I, should I say something? And I have to say, I have to just say, you know what? I know they're slandering me. I'm not going to go an eye for an eye. I'll just say, yeah, they're, they're pretty awesome. And I'll leave it at that. Because I want to be restored. I want to be rebuilt. And here's what you cannot do. Here's what will not work. In a public setting, you speak very highly so you can look like everything's okay. But privately, you go back in the car or go back to your house and you start bashing them again. Because what happens is, is when you begin to curse those who curse you, when you begin to get, go for an eye for an eye, here's what happens. The enemy is planting seeds in these different areas of your life. I want you to think about this for a moment. I want you to think about the different areas of your life. Let's think about the workplace. Um, are there issues in the workplace with somebody? Think about your, your relational uh, relationships outside the workplace. Are there issues outside the workplace in your family or in your friend group? Uh, in church, do you have issues in the church? There's a good chance that if you have enemies in those areas, the enemy has planted seeds in different these areas, and he's continued to water them so that it will pr produce fruit of division. So you're asking yourself, how in the world do I uproot these seeds so that I don't have any enemies everywhere I go, and every time I see somebody's face, I lose my appetite? Well, he's telling you, when you do good and when you bless them, you begin to uproot the seeds the enemy has planted. That's literally what's going on, that you are uprooting the division and the seeds that the enemy has planted. And the Word of God works. Then he says this. So, number one, here's how you love your enemies. Do good to them. Find opportunities to serve them. Number two, bless them. Just say great things about them. They're made in the image of God. God bless their souls. God loves them. That's a true statement. So you can say stuff like that. Then he says this. Pray for those who mistreat you. This, this is difficult, but let me just very practically, God already knows who you um, do not like or who you struggle with. Uh, when I've had to do this, do you know what my prayer life sounds like? I'm just going to be completely honest with you. Here's what it sounds like. God, I cannot stand this person, but I don't want to not be able to stand this person that you love. The truth is I don't only, I don't love them, I don't like them, I don't want to be around them. I need your help, God. That, that's an open and honest prayer to God. Where are we going to start by loving your enemies? Will you help me? Because I can't do it, nor do I want to. You know what happens? I'm telling you, I have done this and it works. You know what happens when you keep praying for the people that have deeply hurt you and it's hard? And I'm just going to be honest, sometimes it's like five seconds there I did it. You know what happens? It, it's crazy that the Holy Spirit, when you apply the Word of God, begins to transform you. And then you begin to see these people and have compassion on them. You begin to have compassion on them. You begin to have compassion on your parents who really hurt you. And you begin to pray for your parents because they really hurt you or they abandoned you or they did something. And you begin to pray for them and God begins to reveal to you, well, here's why they are the, the way they are because something happened to them when they were children. And then you begin to pray for other people and you start to see, oh, they're insecure. What happened to them when they were younger? And then the Holy Spirit begins to give you compassion for these people. And all of a sudden, when you begin to pray, here's what's crazy, when you begin to pray for your enemies, you take off the lens of the flesh and you put on the lens of the Spirit. And you begin to see them the way God sees them. So when you pray for your enemies, you're putting on the lens 
of Christ and you see them differently. It's going to be hard, it's going to be challenging, but this is how you get over it. You do good to them, you bless them, you pray for them, those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, it says to turn the other one. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. And these are all countercultural stuff that just sounds absolutely crazy. So you have to do good to someone you can't stand. You got to speak highly of them. You got to pray for them. This is the cure to spiritual health. Then it says, turn the other cheek. You know they're hurting you intentionally. Do not respond. Let God be God. Let him be your protector. Let God do it for you. If you have somebody in your life right now that is, is, you know, is, I'm not telling you to not defend yourself, but I am telling you that you can trust God to be your father and your protector. And here's what I want you to know. There have been times uh, in my life, I've been in ministry for 20 years, that, and, uh, you know, you have employees, and some of you are, are leaders, and some of you have in, employees or coworkers. And, and there have been times where, as a leader— that you begin to love your, your staff. And then there have been times where as a leader that you pour into them, then all of a sudden the person you were pouring into kind of turns on you and betrays you. And they hurt you deep, deeply. And you're confused because you, your mind starts going to, I've done all of these things for you. How dare you hurt me like this? Here's what's even more exhausting is that if you leave here and you take these principles and you start applying them and you don't see them working. So here's what you have to know. These biblical principles of loving your enemy will not fix them, but it will free you. These biblical principles will not fix them, but it will free you. Because their issue is not your issue. Their dysfunction is not your dysfunction. It will not fix them. So when you are blessing, when you are speaking highly, I will just tell you, if you're expecting them to change, don't. Why do you say that, pastor? This is why I love the scripture. Listen, verse 30, 34, I'm going to verse 35, excuse me. But love your enemies, do good to them, Lend to them without, without, look at this, without expecting to get anything back. Whoa. So you're telling me to love them, to do good, and don't expect them to change? That's what I'm telling you. Do not expect to get anything back. Just keep loving like Jesus because it will set you free. But hold on. But wait. There's more. Then your reward will be great. What is great? I don't know. But if Jesus says it's great, it's going to be great. I don't know what that reward is. Maybe it's simply you being set free. I'm not sure what it is, but Jesus says if you do this and don't expect anything, because here's what's going to happen. If you keep loving the people you know have been saying things about you, and then you expect them to change, and there's no return on your investment, you will become even more bitter and more angry. Which is why, if you go back to this word love in the Greek, do you know that this word love means to continuously love? It's a constant transaction of love. But you have to decide to make that constant transaction of love and every day decide. And let me tell you, you won't always be great at it. But keep pursuing love and expect nothing from them. As the band is coming up, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a closing story. I think the very first step out of this for you, whoever came to mind, it's really, even, even this morning, we're going to sing a song, but it's probably coming to the Lord just saying, will you help me? And being honest with God. And let me be very clear. People usually come after, up to me after sermons like this, and you're saying, they say, how do you expect me to be friends with somebody who has done this, this, and this, and this? Let me just tell you, I'm sorry that there's deep, deep pain in your life. 
And I am not telling you to go be best friends with someone that has caused great trauma in your life. But speaking from experience, I'll, I'll tell you, you can be set free. They may not be fixed, but you can be set free. There's this movie, Les Miserables. You may have heard of it. It's a very popular musical. It's a novel. I love the movie. A great friend of ours in the church int- introduced the movie to us. And, and, and I've always heard of it, but I've never been a guy who um, likes to listen to musicals. Um, I don't know why I just kind of got bored through those musical stuff. After four kids, I sing through the musicals now with them. <laughs> but this particular movie was, was drenched in God's grace. And, and this movie is about uh, th- th- this man. Uh, his last name is Val- Valjean. Jean Valjean. It's French. And this man is, is a criminal, and he can't escape his criminal past. It's like everywhere he goes, the, the DNA in him is just to do something bad. And, he, and he, so he's running and he's being chased by this other man who's trying to catch him. And then it goes to this scene where uh, Valjean is laying there uh, outside and it is absolutely freezing cold, blistering cold. And he is shivering and he is hungry. He is obviously starving and he is homeless. And you can just see this scene. It's set up in a way where you can tell this guy is exhausted and he's tired of life. He's exhausted and he's tired of life. And then all of a sudden it cuts to uh, this bishop walking down the road and the the bishop sees him and and the bishop invites him into his house and and they sit down, this this huge awesome table and they're serving uh, Valjean food and he's just eating like he hasn't eaten in days and they're bringing out the best silver for this guy and they're loving him and they're saying, hey, take a shower. We have a bed for you. My home is your home. And this bishop is just loving on this guy like crazy. Little does he know this guy is is a criminal, but he doesn't even ask the question before he extends his love which is amazing to me because typically we withhold our love until we know the people's position. But he extends his love before he knows anything about this person. He extends the love. He didn't ask him, what's your political views before I love you like Jesus does? What kind of sin are you in before I love you like Jesus does? No, no, no. I'm going to extend my grace and love because my grace and love is going to what transforms his heart. See, often in Christianity, we have it mixed up. We think that we will withhold our grace and love until a person changes, then we will extend it. But according to the Scripture, extending the grace and love is what changes a person. So, so they're eating, and then all of a sudden, the, the scene goes to it's nighttime, and the guy's laying in bed, uh, and he's scruffy, and he's just, you can tell he's been homeless for a while. And then it's like he has this thought, and he gets up into the middle of the night, and he begins to steal the silver. And you think, like, dude, what are you doing? So he steals all the silver, and he's running out the door. And it's like he's running out the door, and the silver's kind of falling here and there. And then all of a sudden, it cuts to a scene where authorities bring him back to the bishop. The dude is on his knees. There's a bag of silver here. He's bleeding, and he's like, I'm busted. And the authorities look at the bishop, and he says, hey, we found this guy. He stole your silver. He's saying you gave it to him, but he stole it. And I love the bishop's reaction. He says, yeah, I gave it to him. In fact, you forgot the best of the silver. And he goes to the table, and he gets the best of the silver. And he comes, and he gives it to him. And the guy's sitting there like he cannot believe. He cannot believe the grace and mercy he's experiencing from somebody he just betrayed and crossed. The authorities leave, and the bishop looks at him. He says, I have saved your soul for God. And that act of kindness, that the the extension of grace to a man who certainly did not deserve it, that is the picture of this text. Love your enemies and be ready to extend the silver if needed. It's hard, it's challenging, and you don't want to do it. Maybe you're in the position of the bishop and you're saying, look, I, I, I don't want to give them more silver. They've already hurt me enough. 
but I'm telling you, it'll set you free. Or maybe you're, you're like the criminal on the run and you're exhausted. Let me just tell you, Christ has already extended the grace. It's there for the taking. So this morning, I'm going to ask our pastors to come up. We're going to sing a closing song this morning. I just want you to do work with Jesus, whatever it is, whoever's in your heart, where you just ask God, and you probably can't even utter their name out. And you could even say, God, I can't stand this person. Would you please help me? And here's the thing with these biblical principles, you'll have to do them over and over and over and over again. Father, would you help your people this morning? Would you help your people, God? Would you help me? As the enemy loves for us to create new enemies over and over and over, it, it's amazing how the enemy gets us to a place where we cannot stand people who are made in the image of God. And God, I'm sure all of us can have great reasons for hating the people that you died for. And we can justify our feelings, but the truth is, God, The truth is that we are, we are not free people if we live this way. If we do not know how to love our enemies, we are not free. Not to condone, not to act like it didn't happen, but to love with the love of Christ. Would you help us? Please help us. Would you please set us free in the areas that we are in bondage? Would you even help us to release the people that we've been holding captive in our minds? Would you help us to release them? Release them, God. So, Father, do work in our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.